The fourth. Like the first three, the fourth was robed in white. He resembled those who came before and that he too had white hair and beard. Like the third, his life had been focused in the application of his mind, but compared to the third, he seemed somehow less in pride. To Torin, he seemed light and unusual, but grounded. She noticed a certain relief in the tension she had felt within her husband, though not enough to return the warmth she had known as he helped her raise her children. At her dinner's spring, she had known as much warmth in him as she would witness, for in that space of the pool, his cares were relieved. She realized now she watched him in a colder space, where his cares were embodied by these greatest of men who took their turns to stand before him. This was the world that constituted the weight that lay ever upon him. The man's incisive face sharpened into piercing eyes above high and prominent cheekbones. He looked into the traveler's eyes and then bowed his head before speaking. I lived many years after my predecessor with whom you just spoke. And in that time, through misguided attention, much of the fair wood became corrupted by an uncorrected miscomprehension of the nature of its heart. Because of this weakness, the wood became infested, the reaching sinews of the forest of man encroached. My time came when the wood's protective cloak threatened to itself corrupt its noble charge. So as to re-establish the strength of the wood against the outer forest, I was given the task of realigning the understanding of the supposed wise with wisdom. My objective was a return to simplicity, a threefold comprehension of life where all action is directed according to the influence of beauty. I sought to make clear the principle that two opposing forces act on the embodied. One force is the desire for unity, the other is the contrary desire for material satisfaction. I wished by this to reinforce the core of my predecessor's teaching and to correct its course where it had strayed from its focus. Long ago, the foundations of our thought were widespread and naive. Over time, our thought focused and was magnified into the forms that would carry mankind forward over the ages. As our knowledge increased, so did the core recede from consciousness, left as it was to other forces that rejected reason, that found basis in faith alone. We too realized there was much we could only imperfectly comprehend, and thus we carried our own faith forward, but we always sought to mirror our faith with reason so that there would be reason for faith other than blindness. We did not accept incompatibility between our abstract comprehension of the unity of the universe and our rational comprehension of the multiplicity of manifestation. Indeed, we understood that to fully comprehend the unity of our knowledge, we would have to uncover that unity to our eyes. Therefore, we had to balance the interests of that which we understood to be our guide and that which we saw before us. We understood that where the guide receded, knowledge would fall astray. We also understood that where knowledge receded, blind faith would result. This careful balance, viewing both the abstract and the manifested, would have to be maintained if we were to successfully protect and increase our comprehension of truth. It was this balance that was the objective of my task. It was mine to re-establish, to maintain for the benefit of our heirs. The Traveller spoke. You learned much from the experience of your predecessors, and you returned the focus inward and upward. You comprehended that the nature of truth can be found in the ranging degrees of beauty from the basest to the most high. The purified society is the one that looks to intellect based in unity. It is made up of those who support the wide diversity inherent in unity. When you spoke of the purified man, you little realized the extent to which he himself influences that which is beneath him. For beneath him is the matter of which he is made, which ultimately is shared by him with all else. Beauty arises when the focus of the controlling force of intellect rests on the divine. Only in that light may all fall into grace. The man, his head low before the traveller, spoke. I found that all fell from unity, and I applied the principles of unity to man's experience in the simplest terms. I found that the answers to man's happiness and to his success lie in the same spheres, and those spheres have little to do with man's material appetite. But man's soul is his appetite, and it is insatiable. It is the magnet that draws men further and further from unity, through a constant striving for the achievement of insubstantial goals. Such men become addicted to their pursuits, jealous of their rewards. These men are deaf, they do not hear in the present, and over the course of time others take their place. This impediment could not but constrain my own hope for success. The man bowed and turned, walked away from the traveller, took his place in the ark, and the man to his left stepped forward and approached. 